live in a world our ancestors would barely recognize. Around the globe, the impact of human ingenuity is now everywhere. We've pushed back the limits of our planet at speeds, depths, and heights that would have left our forebears breathless. Driving all these achievements is humankind's extraordinary gift for invention. Through genius and inspiration, we've created exceptional solutions to complex problems. From the everyday to the spectacular, some good and some not so good. This series celebrates the million ways our great inventions have transformed our world. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Of all the inventions to come out of the 20th century, it's had one of the greatest impacts on our lives. It's brought the world together. It was a form of sort of shared consciousness on a global scale. You could be halfway across the world, but find this affinity. But it's also changed the way we live. When it comes into the living room, into the home, it changes the family dynamic. From bringing the effects of war and conflict into our living rooms, to changing the way we make important decisions. Now the entertainment and opinion-altering machine called television is with us everywhere. What would life be like without them? We'd probably all read books, sing songs, and play charades for hours on end. Pretty bleak. The televisions in our living room are the result of a genuinely international collaboration. Components from all over the world are combined to create televisions of all sizes that now do so much more than transmit television. The quality of the picture and the range of the multimedia capabilities are checked automatically by computers, ensuring that our TVs are better than ever before. And the definition of the images are challenging the resolution of the human eye. 4K, 8K, even on screens that can roll up. It seems incredible that just over a century ago, the idea of transmitting moving images was just a dream. So how did this magical world-changing invention become a reality? The idea of capturing movement in a picture has enthralled us for millennia. I think from the moment that people, you know, humans began to paint, human, humans began to recreate their world, you see quite often in cave paintings a sort of a form of early animation, which is a series of frames, a series of events that are going on. They're trying to create this sense of movement. But it's not until the mid-1600s that inventors managed to project moving images onto a screen. Christian Huygens invents the magic lantern and this strange little device with lenses, glass, throwing images using a lantern onto a wall would produce primitive moving images. That playing with light is very important because once you get to light and glass, then you're getting to a point where you're beginning to approach a lens. And by the mid-1800s, a new chemical process managed to capture these images and freeze them onto paper. The photograph was born. A photographic image is created by converting light into a chemical reaction. Light enters through a pinhole in the camera lens, and the more light, the greater the chemical reaction. Developing the chemical reaction on the photographic paper creates an image. For the first time ever, a single moment in time could be eternally captured in a photograph that could be seen by millions. It wasn't long before inventors wondered whether we could capture moving pictures. Early pioneers had an idea, and it relied on the strange way our brain processes images. There's something that our brain does that's called persistence of vision. If you display a bunch of photographs one after another, because it can only process the photograph for so much time, it fills in the gap between one photograph and another. 
the brain puts all these pictures together in what seems like a seamless flow of images. But these fairground flicks could only be seen by one viewer at a time. By the late 1800s, a new technology was developed, allowing hundreds to view moving images. The motion picture camera. Translucent photographic film runs behind a lens at speed, each frame sharply exposed by the rapid opening and closing of a shutter. When you shine light through the transparent images, they come to life. From cave paintings to Hollywood, the moving camera becomes a reality. Cut! Fine! Great! Entertainment enters a new era. When this phenomenon is revealed to the public, it's an instant sensation. So effective was the illusion of movement that there were reports early moviegoers were convinced it was real. The one that most often springs to people's mind is a short film made in France of a train coming into a platform. There were reports at the time of people trying to flee the cinema because of the way in which the train appeared to be coming straight at them. The movie industry boomed, and there were queues outside picture houses around the world. The race was on for inventors to bring this sensational new entertainment form into the home. By the 1920s, wireless radios had shown that it was possible to transmit at least sound into the living room. First, a microphone converts sound into an electrical signal. A thin membrane vibrates as it's hit by sound waves. The tiny movement is converted into an electrical signal. A carrier signal then transmits the information over long distances into people's homes. The receiver on the other end converts the modified radio waves back into the original electrical signal, which is amplified to vibrate a speaker that recreates the original sound waves picked up by the microphone. But could you convert moving images into electromagnetic waves and then back into images to deliver pictures straight to the living room? The race was on to invent a way of converting light and sound into electrical signals. London, 1926. In a makeshift laboratory, failed inventor John Logie Baird is feverishly looking for a way to leave his mark on the world. Now, he was your classic madcap inventor. He tried to invent all sorts of things that have pretty much sunk into history, like a new air-soled shoe, a type of manufactured diamond, a safety razor made of glass that he had to stop working on because he cut himself really badly, and a homemade hemorrhoid cream. Despite all these failures, he doesn't give up, and it's his next obsession that is what we remember him for, transmitting moving images. Baird knew that it was possible to turn sound into an electrical signal that could be broadcast through the air. But how could he take these pictures and translate them into an electronic signal that would allow him to transmit them? The impossible becomes possible for Logie Baird by the recent discovery of a curious new invention that turns light into an electrical signal, the photoelectric cell. As light falls on that cell, depending on if there's more light or less light, you get a smaller or larger electric current, and that means you can transmit that light level. The key was to somehow split images up into packets of information that could be rebuilt into pictures in the home. So how do you break down an image, you know, all the different locations into, is there like there, is there not like there, that sort of thing. They had actually come up with this idea of having a, a, a disc with holes in that you could spin to build this up. In 1926, John Logie Baird is ready to test his new invention. The subject he chooses to transmit in this potentially historic moment is a ventriloquist's dummy. As the disc spins, each hole allows light from different sections of the image to pass through to the light-sensitive cell. As the changing light hits the cell, it generates an electrical signal. You get a pattern of electrical signals that tells you the brightness of each individual column in the image and once you'd got that whole image, you could translate that into an electrical signal 
and transmit it. Once the signal reaches the living room, the process is reversed. It drives a lamp that pulses brighter or darker depending on the signal strength. In front of this lamp is another spinning disc. Precisely matching the speed and position of the original, it projects individual lines of light that recreate the original image. The person looking at that image is seeing the right brightness in the right place, and so they get what looks to them like a moving image. As the machine whirs to life, incredibly, the dummy's ghostly image appears at the other end. This is an utterly huge moment. It is the birth of television, something that is now such a huge part of our lives. That was its very inception. Television is born. But Baird's invention isn't the one that will end up in our homes. Mechanical television had too many problems to take over the world. This thing is absolutely tiny to start with. You know, the screen is only about an inch wide, uh, and, and it doesn't have a lot of detail, so very blurry images. And remember as well, this is mechanical. Moving parts are noisy. There's got to be a better way. A completely different system for turning light into electricity will change our world. And the inspiration came from a very unusual place. Nineteen twenty one, Idaho. Farm boy Philo T. Farnsworth becomes obsessed with the technological marvel of his age. The fourteen year old Philo Farnsworth moved with his family to a farm in Idaho, and the family farm got electricity. Farnsworth was fascinated by it, and something sparked in Philo's mind. He thought maybe this electricity, this fascinating new invention could be used to transmit a moving image. Fittingly for a 14-year-old with only a rudimentary knowledge of physics, his idea is reassuringly down to earth. His inspiration came from the farm. He was out there, 14 years old, plowing the field in straight lines, and he thought, maybe a moving image could be cut into lines like the plow lines on his field, and those lines could each be turned into an electrical signal, and those electrical signals could be converted back into lines of an image at the other end. A 14-year-old kid on a farm in Idaho came up with the fundamental idea that makes television. Genius. Farnsworth's childhood inspiration will eventually change the world. Today, television is directly broadcast to us in our homes, on the beach, on the train, anywhere we want. It's created global phenomena, pinups, and kept us up to date with news from all corners of the globe. But none of this could happen until the farm boy found a way of making his dream a reality. Farnsworth turns to the one person in his small town who might be able to help. His high school teacher, the scienciest person he can find, that's who helps him turn this dream into a real idea. By 1927, he makes the world's very first demonstration of electronic television, the image dissector. The key improvement of Farnsworth's concept over Logie Baird's was that it had no moving mechanical parts. Instead of using spinning disks to convert light into an electrical signal, Farnsworth uses a device called a cathode ray tube that sends beams of electrons to scan an image in a series of lines, just like plowing a field. A cathode ray tube is a glass tube from which almost all of the air has been removed. And that means that if you fire an electron in that tube, then it can move pretty much freely because there's nothing in the way. There's no gas molecules to stop it. Those electrons can then turn into a flash of light. Then you can use this to display an image. The electron beam is controlled by fluctuating magnetic fields that send the beam across the screen in a series of precise lines. As the intensity of the beam changes, it creates areas of varying light and shade. The beam moves so fast, it tricks the human eye into seeing solid images. 
Then you have to redraw those images quickly enough that it gives the illusion of movement. If you can put all of these pieces together, then you've got the building blocks of an early electronic television. It took Farnsworth eight years to transform cathode ray tube technology into a moving image with no moving parts, making John Logie Baird's mechanical system obsolete. But Farnsworth's television is no use without a camera. Enter Soviet emigre Vladimir Zvorokin, an inventor obsessed with the conversion of moving images into electrical signals. Turned down by his bosses at Westinghouse, Zvorokin takes his idea to another company. Luckily for Zvorokin, the head of a company called RCA did see the light, or at least the way to turn the light into an electrical signal. You were a good salesman, and I was a good dreamer. We talked about broadcasting moving images by electronics. In fact, he made Zvorokin the head of this division of the company, giving him a chance to really put his ideas to the test. At RCA, Zvorokin is encouraged to develop his iconoscope. Like Farnsworth's television screen, the iconoscope uses a cathode ray tube behind a lens to convert light into electrical signals. Zvorokin, he has the principle of the drawn lines, the electron beam hitting the cathode ray tube. And that's really essentially the pattern, the model that everything's built from. But his television camera was far more complex than Farnsworth's television screen. Perhaps the farm boy could help simplify it. Zvorokin, he was within grasping distance. He could see how it could work, but there was a jump that he wasn't able to make, and he couldn't work out what it was. Word filtered through to RCA that there was another inventor, the beautifully named Philo T. Farnsworth, who was working on an invention which, to all intents and purposes, was the same basic principle. The genius from the farm was back in the picture. Zvorokin pays Farnsworth a visit. What happened at that meeting is lost to history. But Zvorokin must have discovered something in Farnsworth's invention that would transform his television system. When Zvorokin came out of Farnsworth Lab, one of the first things he did was contact RCA and tell them to make a copy of what he'd just seen. Reading the descriptions of the two devices, the way in which the electron beam was used to scan the image and transmit an image was very similar. The way that it built up the image line by line is, again, is very, very similar. Within a few years, Zvorokin has perfected his first ever working camera. Television as we know it has arrived. But who was the inventor? The Russian emigre and the farm boy from Idaho both have slightly different systems. While Zvorokin's is adopted in America, Farnsworth is forced to look overseas. Farnsworth goes to Europe, and he, he basically is taking around his invention, looking for people who are interested in it. In Germany, he finds a publicity-hungry political party who immediately see the potential of Farnsworth's image dissector. People who think this is a phenomenal idea, we can do a lot with that as Nazis, Nazi Germany. Because the idea of being able to broadcast propaganda into people's homes, I mean, that's the essence of the, the Nazi rise to power, is the effective use of propaganda. And with the 1936 Olympics coming up, the Nazis see television as an ideal way to promote the games and the fledgling Third Reich. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels relishes the thought of beaming moving pictures across the nation and Europe. In propaganda terms, it would be a double whammy. They had two ambitions there. One is to show the superiority of the Aryan race, but two, through technologically achieving the ability to broadcast television, they were attempting to prove that they were the most technologically superior country. But the Nazis soon discover the downside of being pioneers. In the age before satellites, their ability to showcase the dramatic potential for television would be seen by a relatively small number. You could only broadcast to people who are within a direct line of sight of a, of a radio antenna. And so this meant for the Olympic Games, it could only really broadcast to people nearby in Germany. 
And there's another more obvious obstacle to the Nazis getting their twisted message across to the German people. Most folks back then didn't have a TV set, but the Nazis were so determined to show off their superiority that they set up these special viewing rooms in, in Berlin and, and Potsdam for people to gather and actually see the Olympic Games without being in the stadium. And those who did see it were mesmerized. This really was a groundbreaking event because for the first time people were able to watch a live sporting event without physically being there. You have a collective watching television together. We're quite used to this now, but at that moment, if you couldn't go and see the games, it was perhaps even more thrilling to see them on a screen. In a moment of supreme irony, the Nazis' global first was showcasing the combined work of Farnsworth, a Mormon, and Zvorikin, a Jew. Both persecuted minorities. Even their message of racial superiority was blunted. The Nazis' grand plan of showing off their superiority backfired in a rather major way because, of course, Jesse Owens, an African-American athlete, proceeded to win, well, pretty much everything he entered. Hitler's hoping that what it'll show is the superiority of the Aryan race, but of course, it, it doesn't show that at all. It shows the amazing Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens set television down a path that would create a global behemoth, changing our relationship with sporting events forever. We see the birth of the first televised sporting superstars. So you kind of think of, you know, the Messis and the Ronaldos of today. Well, it was that moment that began it all. The modern sporting industry is entirely shaped around the television set. I mean, it, it exists in the form it does because of the arrival of television. It's unlike anything else that happened before. It's unlike radio. It's the idea of seeing live sports in front of you when you're nowhere near that event. It's the spark that changes the world of sport forever. Sports on television taps into an important part of our psychology in a way no other entertainment form had done before. We're social beings, right? So team sports are appealing precisely because they appeal to that part of our psyche, right? And you think about, you know, everything's set up so you feel part of the team, the colors you wear, you know, the chants that you sing, the fact that you're all in a group at the same time having, a, you know, a unified purpose. And it's a phenomenon that is truly international. The wonderful thing about what TV sports does is you could be in Canada and supporting, you know, a team in Europe. You could be, you know, halfway across the world, but find this affinity. And I think that's what the televised aspect does. Why would you go to the ground? You know, people throw beer on my head from behind without even intending to. And so with television, you've got all the beauty of sport without the, the, the horror. Today, the sports industry is worth upwards of $620 billion a year. But in 1939, television's path to global domination had to be put on hold. Just three years after the first televised Olympics, the Nazis create a global crisis. And the genius inventors behind television are called upon by the Allies to develop new technologies to help defeat the Axis powers. Philo Farnsworth and Vladimir Zvorikin use their television expertise to develop radar and early night vision. By 1945, the war is over, and the world begins to pick up the pieces. In the aftermath, television fast emerges as one of the defining technologies of the 20th century. Television will become a worldwide hit, but the driving force behind its rise to power is the United States. For many Americans, life after the Second World War was good, very good. The nation cements its place as a new world superpower. The unprecedented manufacturing capability built up during the war is poised to exploit the peace. You've got the production line, you've got new plastics, you've got new materials coming online. Suddenly, the idea of what was previously an unimaginably expensive item, like a refrigerator, becomes affordable to 
the booming consumer groups. And so there's this explosion in things that are democratically available. And American consumers don't hold back. Items that were previously unattainable become an everyday reality. Keeping up with the Joneses is kicked into overdrive. Human beings are creatures that respond to status very much. Now, one of the indicators of status or success are the material goods that we accumulate. So post-war, when all of a sudden, you know, there's, there seems to be you know, much more abundance than there was, these status symbols become important. And of all the must-have luxury items rolling off the production line and into the home, television becomes the glue that holds this nation of immigrants together. All of a sudden, the TV becomes one of the most important status symbols. So I can talk to you about what I saw on TV the other day, and I can join in the conversation when other people are speaking about it. So it becomes this kind of great social connector as well. The impact is spectacular. From under one million television sets in 1948, within just seven years, there were over 37 and a half million. In Europe, Asia, all over the world, there's an explosion of television manufacturers and owners. And it's continued through to today. Around 230 million television sets are sold each year, and almost 80% of households own one. Back in the 1950s, television had already transformed the sports industry. It was now poised to become the driving force for prosperity around the world. Television advertising became the beating heart of capitalism. The people who understood the, the, the power and the value of this medium were the advertisers. And they were the people who understood that you could fill this airtime with stuff and people would watch. From the very beginning, advertisers realized that to sell products, you had to have an audience. A lot of the early game shows, Wheel of Fortune, those sorts of things, they are advertiser-owned properties that the advertisers give to the television companies, and they place their sponsored material around it. The first, you know, regular dramas in people's lives were the soap operas, and these were, again, created by advertising agencies given to television companies so that they could put their brands around it. The advertising industry creates television content just to drive the market. The inventors of television had transformed the world in ways they could never have imagined. By the early 1950s, a new generation of experts were on the cusp of taking black and white television to the next level. When you look at the world around you, you can see millions of different colors. But what's incredible is that that information is actually brought to you by just three different kinds of receptor on the back of your eye. One that detects red light, one that detects green light, and one that detects blue light. And that means that no matter how subtle or complicated you might feel the hues are in front of you, you can actually make all of them just by mixing the right amount of those three colors of light. A black and white television screen is coated with phosphor and only lights up in shades of gray. If engineers could mimic the human retina on the inside of a television screen, they could transform black and white into color. It's the same principle for creating color used by television manufacturers today. But for 1950s engineers, it meant tripling the complexity of the cathode ray tube. But if you want a color TV, you need three different kinds of phosphor that are gonna give off red light, green light, or blue light when the beam of electron hits them. Instead of having one black and white image, you have to have a red image, a green image, and a blue image, which is created by hitting each of those different lines of phosphor. And that means that then you can build up those three images on top of each other and create any color you like. If you have red, green, and blue all together, you get the color white. If you have none of them, you get the color black. And by different combinations, you can get any other color you can think of. As early as 1951, color TV began being broadcast in the United States. And inevitably, it was the advertisers who first saw the value of promoting products in vibrant color. If you're going to show a cooked meal, it's going to look so much better if you can see the color of that meal and not just see a black and white version of it. There are people who dress food, paint food, put things on so, so that everything feels more vibrant and exciting. So they really, really understand the value of color. Advertising, game shows, dramas, regular features of the television landscape 
are soon transforming global culture. But it's one single genre of television that will have the most dramatic impact on societies around the world. For centuries, people read about the news, first months, then days after the event. With radio, news is broadcast directly into the home, and people hear about it within hours or even minutes of an event. But as television ownership exploded in the 1950s, news was completely turned on its head. For the first time, it became possible for the population to see what was going on around the world. With the news on TV, it feels like it's the first person. It doesn't feel like you're telling me the story. It feels like I'm there. And because of that, there's a rawness to it and, and I think, a, you know, an honesty to it. Politics in particular was affected in a way no one could see coming. People are no longer so interested in how things sound. They're kind of looking for the person who looks good, who they trust. Nowhere is this clearer than in 1960, with the United States' first ever televised presidential debate. 70 million Americans tune in to watch Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy debate on stage. Nixon had just come out of hospital. He wasn't well. Um, under the bright lights of the studio, he looked sweaty, which to Americans at home watching him made them think he was nervous. Why would he be sweating in this scenario? Kennedy was very, very televisual. I mean, Kennedy's the first modern television president. Once again, television proved adept at tapping into our psychology. Those that listened to the debate on the radio had Nixon ahead. Those that watched on TV had Kennedy ahead. Why? Because we make decisions based on what we see. So Kennedy is a young, healthy, attractive man. Nixon is older, he's feeble. So I think that we're primed to kind of look at visual cues to see how honest someone is, how passionate they are, and cues that we might not be able to pick up just in their voice. Television was having other profound effects on society. Today, we're used to receiving television images 24-7, fed from around the globe as they happen. But in the early days of television, that wasn't possible. The line of sight broadcast methods meant transmission relied on a series of relay towers. Getting images across oceans had to be done the old-fashioned way. One way you can get around this is by having a, a film camera actually filming the pictures on a television screen. It sounds utterly crazy, but that's what they did, and they would uh, ship the film to where it needed to go. Fast forward to the 1950s, and videotape technology is being developed, and that's a much more sophisticated way of doing this. You can directly capture the image onto videotape, uh, but you still need to post it to where it needs to go. That could take days to get there. But by the start of the 1960s, a new breed of inventors are about to shrink the world. After a series of exploratory artificial satellites have blazed the trail, in 1962, Telstar 1 is launched. It's the first satellite in history to receive and transmit a live television image. It's a huge game changer because it opens up being able to get live televisual images from almost any point on the planet. Television, and in particular news, enters a new era. The race is suddenly on to be the first network to get a reporter on the scene. Because there's a huge ratings pressure on television in America, it's not enough for the camera to be there. The camera's got to be there and get the best stories. By the end of the 1960s, the competition to be first pushes journalists to record the vivid frontline details of the Vietnam War. They start showing what's really happening at the sharp edge of the Vietnam War. And what the American public find is that they don't like that. You've got color TV, and what you have is pictures of people being burned by napalm, soldiers being executed on the streets of coffins, on conveyor belts of soldiers coming back home. 
and it's suddenly happening in your living room. You can't pretend this doesn't exist. It's right in your house. It's right in your face. The horrific images dramatically change the way many Americans view the conflict. We begin to see anti-war protests, and we begin to see, you know, thousands of people demonstrating against the war. The experience of these images on TV forms public opinion and makes political change. And this is how important TV becomes from the 1960s onwards. In the early 70s, the very leader of the democratic world is in television's firing line. The American public were ambivalent about Nixon's law-breaking. That changed when they were confronted with the truth on live television. In 1973, former White House counsel John Dean gave testimony to the Senate Watergate Committee. Can you honestly believe that the president was not aware of the full implications of the cover-up activities? I would think the president would certainly have some appreciation of the legal problems involved, yes, indeed. Watergate, it was the televised nature of it that made America turn against their president. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. When Nixon resigns, he resigns on television to the American people. Because by then, the television is no longer just something that's observing. It is the direct line between the president and the people. Television showed it had the power to divide nations and even topple world leaders. But only four years earlier, it also showed the supreme ability to bring the human race together. Satellites allowed television to be transmitted from anywhere on the globe. Soon, the whole world would be watching as it was beamed from another world. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. In the middle of 1969, John F. Kennedy's challenge is about to become a reality. People from all walks of life and all corners of the globe will be fixed to their television sets. On the 20th of July, 1969, the Apollo 11 command module orbits the moon. Over the Sea of Tranquility, the lunar module is released and touches down. My dad woke me up, got me out of bed, and I went downstairs really tired and sat in front of this TV watching this silvery image as Neil Armstrong steps onto the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Everyone wanted to share in that moment, and the only way to do that was to sit in front of the television. It's thought 650 million people tuned in to watch the moon landing. It's one of the greatest events in human history, and television allowed the world to watch as one. And as TV technology moves into the 1970s, the notion of the shared experience changes as the television schedule becomes more personal. It's been possible to record audio signals uh, onto magnetic tape since the 1930s. The tape is simply a strip of thin plastic that's coated in ferric oxide powder. This powder is a ferromagnetic material, which means that if you expose it to a magnetic field, then it remains permanently magnetized by that field. Television broadcasters have used magnetic tape recorders since the 1950s, but they certainly weren't built for the living room. These systems are the size of a chest freezer and would cost almost half a million dollars in today's money. But as the decades rolled on, then production costs came down. Companies started to wonder, well, is there a way we can market this to the everyday consumer? 
By the 1970s, video recording technology had shrunk to the size of a record player. A video cassette recorder, or VCR, is born. Overnight, viewers are no longer slaves to the television schedules. Rather than having to wait for something to come on TV, and if you've missed it, well, it's gone, you're able to put your video recorder on, set a timer, catch that program, and then pop the tape in and watch it back whenever you liked. You didn't just have to watch whatever film was on that night, you could pop down to the video rental store and grab whatever film you wanted and watch it at your own convenience. This was a completely new way that people could interact with their TVs. As the world's leading television manufacturers fight for dominance of the emerging video market, two come to the fore. Sony released a format called Betamax, and JVC one called VHS. Now, these two kinds of tape were not compatible at all, and that meant there was a battle. Who was gonna win? Which were consumers gonna choose? Sony and JVC go into battle, offering distinctly different qualities. Betamax offered better picture and sound quality, while VHS had a longer runtime per cassette. But many believe that in the end, a particular type of content thrust one system to achieve overwhelming market penetration. There's even a rumor that the final deciding factor in this battle was that VHS allowed pornography, whereas Betamax didn't allow any porn. You've got to remember, you know, up until this point, to gain access to pornography, you'd have to physically leave your house, endure the embarrassment to go into an actual theater and watch it. I'd have to go to some seedy cinema in Soho and sit next to a bloke who was coughing and sniffling. You could go home, draw the curtains, turn on your out, and watch your dirty movie. Once the porn industry got into bed with VHS, there was only going to be a happy ending for JVC. Although the idea that pornography is what finally decided the video wars is quite a cute story, ultimately it might just be that VHS tapes and recorders were so much cheaper than their Betamax competitors. And either way, they came to dominate the market. Although VHS has become a relic of a bygone age, it changed viewing habits forever. Today, viewers expect television content on demand. Advances in television technology and the introduction of the internet mean programs can be streamed at the push of a button. To smartphones, tablets, and laptops, you can now see your favorite shows anywhere. Back in 1977, the television set starts showing more than TV when the Atari 2600 game console is released. That means that your television set is now no longer just about television. It starts to become about entertainment, all the entertainment you can imagine. Today, the video game industry is worth $137 billion a year, bigger than both the music and film industries combined. This is really the birth of the television as a complete multimedia device, which it totally is today, where smart TVs can, can stream stuff, you can read your emails, look at websites, as well as watch what you want whenever you want uh, and still watch stuff live. Right. All originated back in the 70s. But invention never sleeps, and televisions are due another massive makeover. For years, television relied on a cathode ray tube to display an image. But as viewers came to expect bigger and bigger screens, this posed a problem. Increasing the screen also increases the size of the cathode ray tube. Large televisions soon became too big for living rooms. If only there were a way to ditch the bulky cathode ray tube. Enter the LED, the light-emitting diode. Now, these can be made much smaller, much lighter than a traditional light bulb, and they can be switched on and off much faster and with a lot more precision. In the early days, LEDs are bulky and expensive, useful for super-large displays, but still too big for the living room. But as new technology reduced their size and cost, television engineers spotted their potential. Today, almost all modern televisions use LEDs to create a picture. Gone are the bulky tubes and the electron beams. Now, LEDs light up a liquid crystal display made up of red, green, and blue pixels. 
Those pixels can either let through light of that color or they can block it. And it's that combination of red, green, and blue light that creates the colors to create that image. It's kind of similar to the older style televisions, but instead of using a cathode ray to light up red, green, and blue pixels, it uses the LEDs to light up red, green, and blue filters. It's more like a constantly changing stained glass window. Television sets have become lighter, bigger, and have phenomenal resolution. And advances in new forms of LEDs are improving the picture quality further still. Television is being viewed in more detail than ever before, and now from any location we want. When television first entered the household in the 1950s, it tied the family to the living room. Before that, you'd have something like the radio. So the focus was different. People could look in different directions, do different things. You could carry on your chores or activities while listening to the radio. When the television comes in, you have to arrange the furniture around it and sit facing the same way, often in silence. But from the very beginning, television was envious of radio's ability to be received anywhere. It wasn't long before early engineers were designing TV sets to escape the living room. TV for teenagers, portable televisions, TV on the beach, TV in the car. But these early portable TV sets were really novelties. It's only now, as the pace of modern invention accelerates, that television can truly break the shackles of the home. Advances in camera technology, smartphones, tablets, and broadband have made it possible for almost anyone to create their own content and show it online. The viewer has now become the broadcaster, and this user-generated content is a growing phenomenon. It upends the idea of television completely because you now no longer have to watch what they are making you watch. You can make your own television. Everyone now has the capability to record something and put it on the internet, often in their pocket. And the same device, your mobile phone, is also the device that will actually enable you to watch whatever content you want to watch. Television ushered in the era of the global village. But the ability to create, watch, and instant message has taken the concept to a level television could never achieve. The other thing, of course, that you have these days is the, the common features. So you can like things, you can engage with other people. So it feels much more inclusive. It feels like you can weigh in in a way that you couldn't really feel about the TV before. But don't expect television to stand still. Having found a way to transmit moving images, color images, sharper images, inventors today are tackling the final frontier taking television into the third dimension. The next big development in home entertainment is going to be virtual reality, um, augmented reality. As soon as people have a, a still picture, they want a moving picture. As soon as people have a moving picture, they want to get into it. Augmented and virtual reality headsets are another quantum leap for television. Setting the viewer inside the story, playing out in 360 degrees around them. With virtual reality, we can place ourselves in the scene, and we have more choice of how we relate to and move through the scene. This idea of immersion is very much at the forefront of future developments in television. With its ability to thrill, inform, warn, outrage, and even manipulate us, the invention of television has radically affected every aspect of our lives. It was a form of sort of shared consciousness on a global scale. It changes how we know what the truth is. And I can't think of anything else that can do that. What would life be like without television? We'd probably all read books, sing songs, and play charades for hours on end. Pretty bleak. Fast and furious. Exciting. Terrifying. We love to scare ourselves, push ourselves to the limit in so many ways. Off-road on a bike, whizzing down a bumpy track, or skiing as fast as you can down a black run. 
That feeling of free fall as you drop and your stomach comes out the top of your head is just the best thing ever. But how can you accelerate from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in a heartbeat? It's not particularly natural to go that fast. As a rational person, I should be wanting to go slowly and just live a boring life. But, you know, every now and again, it's fun. Think of an invention designed to keep dads out of trouble and families together. It connects nylon stockings with railways. It defies gravity, scares us, and we love it. Part of your brain is absolutely convinced you're going to die, whilst the other half of your brain knows that you're perfectly safe. The world would be a much less exciting place without roller coasters. Roller coasters have got an extraordinarily compelling something that we love or hate, or love to hate, but once ridden, never forgotten. Roller coasters were a defining feature of my childhood. I was obsessed with them. It starts off slow, and you don't know what's going to happen, and then you can see the path of it, and then you let go. I'm usually very, very terrified. In 2019, the roller coaster database had registered globally more than 5,000 coasters. In the same year, the theme park with the most was Six Flags Magic Mountain in the United States with 19 roller coasters. They offer an intoxicating, affordable, extreme kick that keeps us coming back for more. It's that exhilaration of wanting to experience speed and the thrill of the ride, but also a nervousness about whether you'll survive. The stomach churning sensations of being thrown into the air or dropped from a height. What is it about roller coasters that excites us in our millions? And how did we come to invent this hair raising ride? This is Bakken, near Copenhagen in Denmark, which claims to have been the world's first amusement park, dating back to 1583. Originally, its woodland location was a place for pagan festivals, and it's steeped in legend. Jugglers would pitch their tents and entertain the locals. There would be music and stalls with goodies for people to buy. By 1840, it was officially expanded with more permanent stalls. There was a steam carousel, curiosities to marvel at, and plenty of live music. In 1932, what was Europe's largest wooden roller coaster was installed at Bucken. But where did the idea for this great invention come from? Historians say that the origins of the roller coaster lie in 18th century Russia, where ice slides became hugely popular. They were specially constructed out of wood and covered with ice, creating a hill on stilts. You had to walk up one side and then enjoy the slide down the other. In the naturally freezing winters of Russia, the slides would have lasted for many months without melting. It seems we'll never grow out of this kind of simple fun. At this contemporary snow and ice festival in Harbin, China, people love the thrills and spills of sliding downhill on their backsides. The Russians had captured the essence of the thrill from sliding fast downhill, but the execution, using nothing but your bottom, or possibly a crude toboggan, left room for improvement. 
The French claim to be the first to add wheels to a rudimentary vehicle moving along a track. Les Montagnes Russes à Belleville, Russian Mountains, opened in Paris in 1812. They sold these rides as Promenade Ariane, or aerial walks. The French had copied the Russian mountains, but adding wheels made them go much faster and added to the thrill of the ride. The car wheels ran in grooves on a fixed track to keep them in the correct position. The drawback in all early designs was getting the cars back up the hill. First, passengers had to climb lots of stairs, then attendants had to push the cars back to the top. But the ride would soon feel tame. It needed an X factor that would bring the customers back over and over again. It was the French again who unveiled a brand new concept in 1846, the centrifugal railway. This highly ambitious next step introduced a loop into the ride. The rider and car were released down the slope. They gathered enough speed to carry them around the circular loop and back up the opposite slope to dismount. Inventors were exploiting the power of momentum, but gravitational or g-force became a critical factor in the safety and feasibility of the ride. G-force is a measure of the force that you are experiencing either due to gravity or due to a sudden change in your direction. So right now, I'm experiencing 1G, thanks to the Earth pulling me down, and that's the, the, the normal feeling that we have. But roller coasters play with that um, and sometimes amplify it so that it feels like we're experiencing 3 or 4Gs. And you can also feel 0Gs, that's weightlessness, and even negative Gs, where the force is acting upwards. Speed is vital to create inertia, which presses your body to the inside of the loop as the train spins around. Because the path is circular, centripetal force is created. Essentially, that tells you what the acceleration has to be to stay on that path. Centripetal acceleration always points towards the center of the circle you're sort of going around. So in the case of the top, the overall force has to be pointing down for you to be following that sort of circular trajectory. Gravity's pointing down, so that's actually contributing. And if you're going fast enough, then also you'll be getting a push from the chair that you're in as well. And the fact that the chair is pushing you down means that actually you're pushing into the chair. So that's why you don't just fall out. Obviously, if the roller coaster weren't moving, then yeah, you're totally gonna fall out. When the French ride was put to the test, the rider was said to have experienced such a delicious feeling that he wanted to try it again. But he was one of few. The speed of the ride and the tightness of the loop would have created a g-force in excess of that experienced by an astronaut taking off in a space shuttle. Totally unacceptable on a roller coaster by today's standards. Early roller coaster designers who wanted to try out using loops, originally used um, a perfectly circular shape for the loop. Uh, but they quickly discovered uh, that due to some funky laws of physics, uh, the physical effects on the riders were enormous. They would go from basically just the normal downforce of gravity to suddenly experiencing six Gs, which is sort of in fighter pilot territory. And then at the top, they would go to sort of zero Gs, and then they'd go back to six Gs again. And the human body just couldn't really take this. It was resulting in broken bones and all sorts of people passing out. We know a lot about how much gravitational force the human body can withstand, thanks to the extraordinary experiments carried out by an American Air Force flight surgeon called Colonel John Stapp. He put himself literally through torture experiencing a maximum g-force of 46.2. On the Holloman rocket sled, Staff reached the top speed of 640 miles per hour and slammed to a full stop in 1.4 seconds. He was lucky to survive, though his sight was badly damaged. The centrifugal railway wasn't anywhere near as dangerous as Colonel Staff's Air Force jet, but nevertheless caused injuries and made people feel ill. 
Roller coasters create g-force on the human body, and this can have a number of effects. It can make us feel lightheaded, it can make us feel dizzy, and in the most extreme circumstance, it can also make us pass out. The centrifugal railway never really caught on, disappearing almost as quickly as it had appeared. The upside-down idea wasn't crazy, but it needed finessing. The loop-the-loop -loop wouldn't make a successful comeback until the Americans tried designing an improved version. But that would take another 50 years. The latter half of the 19th century was boom time for technology and innovation. And Americans wanted their share of the action, which the Russians and French had set in motion. Early train technology was already established in the US. Carriages fitted with wheels were driven along rails. This method of locomotion inspired the creativity and ultimately the birth of the roller coaster as we know it. It's a world in which things are speeding up. Industrial techniques are, 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 are available to large swathes of population. It's a world in which, because things are speeding up, um, time and space are, as it were, being crunched together. So it's an age in which people are traveling further and faster than ever before. The world is shrinking, um, but uh, it's also a world of, of, of some anxiety about what that means. The inspiration for the first American roller coaster had a humble start in a small mining town in Pennsylvania called Mock Chunk. In 1846, a new circular routed railway was installed hauling empty coal wagons uphill by stationary steam engines and sending fully laden ones back downhill using only the momentum of gravity. The fact that the track was a circuit gave it the name Switchback. It traveled back and forth. When the miners didn't need it, this modest little train became a tourist ride. People loved the speed of rolling downhill fast, but it wasn't a roller coaster yet. The story goes that a certain Lamarcus Thompson visited the Pennsylvania Switchback Railway for this germ of a thrill ride to be taken to the next level. The roller coaster as we know it today owes a great deal to ladies' stockings. When nylon stockings went on sale to the American public in 1939, women flocked to stores in their thousands to get their hands on a pair. Four million pairs were sold in just four days. By Christmas, ladies, three million dozen pairs will be on the market. This can be partially attributed to inventor Lamarcus Adna Thompson, who created a device to manufacture seamless ladies' stockings. The hosiery business paved a road to great wealth, but poor health meant early retirement for Thompson. He chose to spend his time designing something rather different. Thompson began working on a number of roller coaster patents, capitalizing on the work already achieved by an engineer named John G. Taylor, who had such patents to his name as the inclined railway and the anti-rollback device, which causes the clank as you go up the lift hill, preventing the cars from rolling backwards. But it was Lamarcus Thompson who would be crowned the father of gravity and credited with inventing America's first roller coaster, a moment in history from which we have never looked back. In 1884, Thompson's Gravity Pleasure Switchback Railway opened in a new holiday resort in Brooklyn, New York City. Seen here in the early 1900s, it was called Coney Island. That first Coney Island coaster was about 180 meters long and ran in a straight line featuring a brake or rollback device. It was this beautiful old wooden thing that supposedly its top speed was 
six miles an hour. Would have been faster to just run down it, but hey, you know, you gotta start somewhere. Despite a snail's pace of just under 10 kilometers per hour, the Switchback Railway was a huge success, with queues several hours long. It was the start of something big on Coney Island. Before long, three amusement parks had opened in that one town at the turn of the 20th century. Steeplechase Park, Luna Park, and Dreamland. New Yorkers and others flocked like bees to a honeypot over the decades. It was a seaside resort offering so much fun, as celebrated in this 1940 film. Coney Island, the world's greatest fun frolic with its beach miles long, all peppered with people. Let's mingle with one million folks, folks who are just like all of us, 100,000 youngsters and oldsters, all swimming, playing, or resting, all getting their share of the sun and the fun. With amusements here, there, and everywhere, it's hard to decide where to start. Rivers of humanity in carnival mood pour through Coney's many streets. Here in this great whirlpool of joy, here for a lark at Coney Island, world's biggest barrel of fun. Being around at the time of the birth of the roller coaster must have been incredibly exciting. Human beings, by their very nature, are novelty seekers. We like the new and the shiny, and also the thrill and excitement. It might seem obvious why roller coasters were invented. Pure thrill, the speed, the illusion of danger. But it seems there was more to it than that the fight against immorality. Pure thrills were not the motivation for Thompson. He saw an opportunity to keep people outside in the fresh air and together as families, away from the temptations of the devil. Perhaps his intention was to bring families together to do a, a, a joint activity because here you ha have a time where perhaps men had all the freedom, held all the cards, could go out gambling, drinking and maybe womanizing and women were left literally holding the baby and perhaps his thinking was you know this is something people can do together but actually offers the thrills and spills that you know will stop men seeking pleasure elsewhere. Thompson was a religious man and wanted to invent something to distract people, particularly wayward fathers, from ending up gambling, in taverns, dancing halls, or worse, brothels. It stemmed from a basic concern about the prosperity Americans were enjoying after the Civil War. He feared the world around him was turning towards a debauched society. There's a consciousness that people are getting more holidays, that they've got some more disposable income, and there's a fear that that will lead people into bad behavior, into drinking, into licentiousness, and into particularly men behaving badly. On the other hand, critics of the early roller coaster, who were as pious as Thompson, did not approve of the invention. I mean, some people disapprove of it hugely, particularly uh, large numbers of preachers and religious teachers at the end of the 19th century are highly, highly opposed to the idea of thrills for thrill's sake, because it's not serious. It's, 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 it's avoiding real life. It's avoiding real issues. But their views did not stand in the way of progress. The roller coaster basics were in place, but there was room for improvement. Man is always wanting to go faster, further, higher, and it's no different with roller coasters. I think roller coaster design engineers they want their passengers to get a greater thrill beyond anything they've designed so far. 
drawing boards began to fill with new possibilities, pushing the bar and stretching technology. Designers were well aware that riders would soon grow tired of the same old track, the same old cheap thrill. They'd be hungry for something bigger, better, faster, scarier. So how did we get from this to this? For all the sophistication and possibilities in the modern world of roller coasters, that clank, smell, and feel of a wooden ride gives people a warm feeling of nostalgia. In 2018, Wicker Man opened at the UK's Alton Towers, specifically to satisfy the die-hard traditionalists who love wood. But everything else about it is state-of-the-art. This seems to be a bit of a, a rebirth of wooden roller coasters within the theme park industry. There seems to be something about them that actually it really excites people, this kind of retro piece of hardware. It shakes, it rattles, it, it feels more natural and organic in the way that it, it runs. Every ride is slightly different, so where you sit the front and the back or the middle, uh, on the left or the right, it's always kind of a different experience. We've also used lots of other special effects, so lighting, smoke, and projections um, to help convey a story, to create that atmosphere. The concept of this particular 21st century ride brings an immersive experience so that it is more than just another coaster. It plays with riders' fears in an imaginary pagan ritual. Safety is, of course, crucial on all Daredevil rides. The cleverness of their design makes them look dangerous, and yet we know they are not if we follow the rules. You know at the back of your mind that this is a safe way to get a thrill. And seeking that thrill, if you like, is the psychological reward. That is the reward in itself. I want to get a thrill, I want to get a buzz out of it, I want to get an adrenaline rush. That's what's going on in the brain. But I know at the end of it, you know, I'm going to be okay. This ride is safety checked every morning. Two technicians walk the track from beginning to end, inspecting every joint, every bend, every nut and bolt, looking for any signs of stress or anything wrong. After this initial check, the ride is under constant scrutiny from the control room throughout the day. IAAPA, the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, state that safety is the number one priority for the industry and its 6,000 members in more than 100 countries. To reduce risks of injury, there are rules. A standard height for riders of every ride in every park is clearly signposted. Riders shouldn't use mobile phones, which could be dropped and then hit someone. Restraints keep riders in the correct position so they won't harm themselves. But accidents do happen occasionally. In this park, five gondolas became detached from their rails on an upside-down bend in 2016. Nine people were injured, most of them children, two of them seriously. To put this into context, injuries are rare. You're much more likely to be struck by lightning or be injured in your car ride to and from the park. There's no hiding that the early days of amusement parks were a risky business. Spinal injuries were reported, people felt ill, and many rides didn't last long because they weren't safe enough or were too uncomfortable. Riders were effectively guinea pigs as designers tested the boundaries of what speeds and curves and falls humans could comfortably endure. That first switchback railway on Coney Island quickly replenished LaMarcus Thompson's coffers following his $1,600 investment. Charging five cents a ride, 
He was in profit in less than three weeks. So industrialization is such a dynamic and such an uncontrolled experience that it enables early innovators to make a huge amount of money. So Thompson and his roller coaster, one can find endless examples of people who have a really good idea and capitalize upon it. Within four years, Thompson was given 30 more coaster-related patents. Imitations and improved new designs were quick to follow. As progress gathered pace, and people tried out exciting leisure activities in every shape and form. It's exactly at the same time that you're beginning to see, for example, downhill skiing develop, which was not something that existed before the late 19th century, which people have to learn to like. And they learn to like it in the same way people learn to like roller coasters, because it's modern, because it speaks to some desire to lose control a little bit, and because it's it's about speed. But fundamentally, how could engineers push the envelope, make the rides much more exciting? An inventor called Lina Beecher worked on the French loop idea. Maybe with modifications, could it work without making people feel sick? Before the flip-flap opened to the general public, it underwent crude safety testing on sandbags and monkeys. In 1895, Flip Flap opened on Coney Island, the first American coaster to turn riders upside down. It certainly provided the thrill designers were striving for, and the public were getting the hang of doing something scary for fun. I think it's great to have escapism in, in our lives so that we're not just ground down by routine and doing the same boring thing every day, because I think human beings like novelty seeking and, and doing something like going on a roller coaster can provide that. Although the monkeys and sandbags had done their job, the extreme G-force gave human riders whiplash and other injuries. Ultimately, the flip-flap was a flop. But Beecher didn't lose heart. The idea just needed finessing. Before long, his next version, called Loop the Loop, opened on Coney Island in 1901. What he'd figured out was that redesigning the loop from circular to tear-shaped, technically called a clothoid loop, would dramatically decrease the G-force. They were trying to look at a way of doing it in a more tapered sense. So you would get the acceleration to get a sort of loop, but not put it through such intense G-forces and extremes in G-forces through that. So the way they do that is, is actually it's very tapered. So you start off with a very long radius of curvature and it slowly gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You get to the top and then it goes back again. So you end up getting this sort of teardrop shape, this clothoid loop as it's known. And it's really just to temper the G-forces but still give you that same sort of experience. But loop the loop didn't last long. The elliptical loops were still too tight for most to stomach, and it closed for safety reasons. It was followed by Drop the Dip, considered to be the first true thrill ride. When we go quickly, we get a sudden surge of adrenaline which is released into the body. And the adrenaline can have a number of different effects on the human body. It makes our heart rate go quicker. It causes blood to be distributed to our muscles. It causes our pupils to dilate. It makes us feel more energetic, more powerful. And all of these feelings together are exhilarating and pleasurable for the individual. It is very primal, even though, you know, it's not particularly natural to go that fast. You know, as a rational person, I, sh you know, I should be wanting to go slowly and just live a boring life, but, you know, every now and again, it's fun. Adrenaline junkies think it's fun to throw themselves at all sorts of hair-raising challenges. Bungee jumping can inflict a G-force of three, for example. Or downhill skiing, where it's possible to reach over 250 kilometers per hour. The man credited as the father of the modern high-speed roller coaster was American engineer John A. Miller. 
He started out working for LaMarcus Thompson before collaborating with others and designing his own rides. Miller was prolific, contributing to around 140 coasters around the world during his long career. What he managed to achieve was higher hills than ever before, like his legendary Big Dipper, which opened in Blackpool in the UK in 1923, seen here in 1960. 3,000 feet in length with cars traveling at 30 miles an hour guarantees a thrill of thrills. Let's go! Miller had huge vision, pushing against all the engineering rules of the time, with more extreme highs and lows and sharper turns to intensify the thrills. So you're trying to accelerate the vehicle at high speed. You're trying to turn passengers upside down. You're wanting to drop them from the height. These are all mechanical challenges because you're playing with acceleration, friction, gravity, the switch between potential energy, which you gain from raising something to a height, or kinetic energy, which comes from dropping something at speed. Miller also invented the safety chain dog, or safety ratchet. A more foolproof mechanism to stop a car or train rolling back downhill if the chain that pulls it up the hill were to break. It's a device that evolved and is still widely in use today. But a hundred or so years later, two loops just wouldn't be enough to satisfy the fans. This coaster was the world's first to have a staggering 14 loops. It travels at up to 85 kilometers per hour and doesn't ever hold up from thrilling its passengers. With every super fast drop, there's a sensation that makes roller coaster lovers keep coming back for more. Fans call it air. Airtime is sort of a, a holy grail for ride designers because that's what's, what gives you this feeling of being in space for a second, of, of finally being weightless. And it's this incredible sensation in your stomach where it's just like, <gasps> it takes your breath away. And then it'll all suddenly come rushing back to you when you reach the bottom of the drop. So yeah, I'm an airtime junkie and I think most roller coaster fanatics are too. It's a sensation that makes us feel frightened and excited at the same time. But what exactly is happening inside our bodies? Well, we get a, the heart and the mouth feeling on a roller coaster because as we accelerate and, our, and as we decelerate, our organs in our body also accelerate and decelerate. And with the play of gravity on the body, it does create this weird sensation of literally having a heart in your mouth. And what is going on inside our heads? I think we also have the wiring for that kind of fight or flight that goes on with us where you know, we get into a situation like our ancestors did where they didn't know if they were going to make it or not. And I think some of that hard wiring is still there. And it's been turned into, if you like, um, a pleasurable situation where you can get those, all those sensations without it ending badly. In the end, coasters exist to make money. Ride designs must stay ahead of the curve to survive in a highly competitive world. And the competition isn't just from other parks. People are at home sitting on their computers or on their phones, and we have to make sure we're creating experiences that actually goes, you can only do this here, you can't do this at home, and you want to come and experience that. And that's what we're competing against is home technology, but how do we do better here at our theme parks with rides and attractions people can experience. At little cost, fans can design and ride roller coasters using a computer game. In fact, they can design their perfect virtual amusement park with as many coasters as they can dream up, all in the comfort of their home. So the real thing has to work doubly hard to create hype and bring in the business. Each new ride must be more exciting than the last, more exciting than any other, ever. Its USP has to make it stand out from the crowd and thrill people before they even try the ride.
the oldest roller coaster still operating today is this one, Leap the Dips, which opened in 1902 in Lakemont Park, Pennsylvania. A bastion of American coaster heritage in a fast and furious roller coaster world. With careful restoration and a large spoonful of nostalgia, it's become a timeless classic. By the roaring 1920s, around 1,500 roller coasters were in operation in America alone. They were often the big attraction that pulled customers into the growing amusement parks, which also numbered as many as 2,000 at that time. Roller coasters symbolized modernity and technology, which were compelling to a young, affluent clientele. The Cyclone Coaster opened on Coney Island in 1927. It's become a classic that's still open today, with 12 drops and reaching a speed of 95 kilometers per hour. It's built on the site of that first switchback railway of LaMarcus Thompson's. It was nearly demolished in the 1970s after an estimated 10 million people had ridden it. But New Yorkers' love of nostalgia won the day, and it survived until now. It also survived the ups and downs of the world around it. The Great Depression hit amusement parks badly in the 1930s. People no longer had the spare cash or the humor for the frivolous pursuit of pleasure. Attractions closed left and right. And by the mid-1930s, only 400 parks were able to keep going across the United States. As World War II left its painful scars, many parks and rides were done for. Those that did cling on were down, but they weren't out. Roller coasters would rise again, with so much potential ahead of them to become more thrilling, more scary, more exciting. Soon after the war was over, amusements, and in particular roller coasters, entered a new era that catapulted them towards an incredibly bright future. It was down to a brand new American invention, the theme park. The world's first theme park is believed to have been opened in Santa Claus, Indiana in 1946. The difference from earlier amusement parks was its singular theme which inspired all the content. In this case, all things North Pole and Christmas. However, it was really another American whose vision changed everything. Mickey and I started out the uh, first time many, many years ago. We've had a lot of our dreams come true. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. That's it, right here. Disneyland. In 1955, Disneyland opened in California and set a bar that those who followed tried to emulate. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here age relives fond memories of the past. And here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future, with the hope that it will be a source of joy to all the world. The vision was one of good, clean fun in a closed, controlled, and safe environment. One entry ticket would buy access to all rides instead of paying as you go. It's again about the industrialization of leisure, if you like. Just as our new car has to be better than the one before it, just as our new phone has to be better. And so roller coasters are subject to the same laws of industrial, commercial life as anything else. It shows us that there actually isn't such a sharp break between leisure and industry as all that.
roller coaster development became entwined with newly available materials, advances in design and technology, and an appetite for even bigger thrills. In 1959, Matterhorn bobsleds opened at the Californian theme park, the first to be built with nylon wheels and more flexible steel tubular rails instead of inflexible wood. These features made the coaster instantly more comfortable to ride. Comfort was improving, speeds were getting faster, and knuckles were whiter as rides galloped towards the unprecedented growth we are seeing today. Theme parks began to crop up around the world, inspired by Walt Disney and his pioneering idea. And that meant a growing demand for rides, and particularly roller coasters. Many parks don't have naturally undulating terrain. So engineers have designed ways of launching coasters on the flat, like this one. It does 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.5 seconds, catapulted by a hydraulic launch system. Another comparable system, the launch induction motor, uses electricity to energize the motor, which produces a magnetic wave. So this is a linear induction motor. An induction motor is usually round. Um, obviously, we've laid it out flat, hence it's called a linear motor. Um, you can see the copper here and the steel core. So this is inside this black coating, which is there to protect the copper when it's on an amusement ride. When we energize this, we get a magnetic field. This is a piece of aluminium, and this reacts against the magnetic field. So if I switch this on... It's based on an invention by Croatian-born Nikola Tesla in 1887. You can see this with this example here. I'm holding the disc a couple of centimeters away from the surface. As I move closer towards the motor, the magnetic field interacts with the disc. The benefits of these launch mechanisms mean a different thrill to the ups and downs of conventional roller coasters. And super fast propulsion without relying on gravity. By the 1970s, it was boom time again for roller coasters, and family fun was the priority. One of the standout rides became the Great American Revolution, which opened in Six Flags Magic Mountain in 1976. Revamped a few years ago, Revolution claims to be the world's first 360-degree looping coaster, with a full vertical loop that hadn't been accomplished before. I mean, they're just so fun. I mean, it's that sense of speed, the G-forces where, where you, 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 know, you get squashed down into your seat or you feel sort of weightless, the, the wind sort of blowing in your face. Uh, and, you know, all the innovations you see now with, like, corkscrews and going upside down, and, like, they really put a lot of thought into how to make this the most exhilarating ride of your life, even though it's only, like, a few minutes. We are living in a theme park boom, with most growth in the Asia-Pacific region and Europe. By 2025, the global market is predicted to be worth over $70 billion. China is forecast to overtake the rest of the world in terms of size of theme park facilities. That means the industry there will have more than tripled within 10 years all thanks to the Chinese middle class having more money in their pockets in a prosperous economy. In 2017, Chinese theme parks had half a billion visitors. What's more extraordinary is that amusement parks didn't even exist in China before the 1980s. Roller coasters can play a vital role in attracting customers to parks, especially if they're breaking a record. Formula Rasa in Abu Dhabi reproduces the thrill of being in a racing car, but on a roller coaster. In 2019, it remained the world's fastest ride, achieving 0 to 240 kilometers per hour in just 4.9 seconds. 
riders experience a body-slamming surge of 4.8 Gs on this coaster, close to that maximum 5 Gs that most people can tolerate. Roller coaster design engineers are wanting to push the limits, always with the human physiology in mind, because you know you can take a ride to greater than five G forces, but you'd be putting the passengers at risk. And there's always this fine balance of pushing designs to their extreme whilst keeping people safe, and that will continue to be an engineering challenge. But the physical thrill of G-Force might be a thing of the past, with rides providing a more cinematic experience. At moments in the ride, you can speed it up when something might be chasing you, then we might slow it down and do something where you're doing a bit more of a story-led experience. Making guests feel like things are moving or the car is responding to events that are happening around them. The sounds, even the smells, everything, as many senses we can kind of touch to the guests, I think that's where we will start heading towards. The potential problem for amusement in theme parks is that to enjoy some new virtual rides, you don't need to go to a park at all. There's a much cheaper alternative in VR centers like this, with motion reality booths that take riders on a roller coaster with all the thrills of the real thing without the lines or G-force to worry about. The future seems as big as our imaginations will allow it to be. Since its invention, the roller coaster has mirrored the world itself. Starting off at not much faster than walking pace, it has become progressively faster and scarier. Never content with ordinary, we've pushed to the extraordinary. We've hurtled towards an ever-disappearing finish line. We've learned to deliberately scare ourselves witless and come out smiling. A roller coaster is designed to challenge your very basic human responses of fear. And that's where the thrill comes from. That feeling of free fall as you drop and your stomach comes out the top of your head is just the best thing ever. They're just the ultimate thrill to me. And we've managed to create a safe escape from a modern world that frustrates and enrages us with an invention that surprises and uplifts us. And for so many of us, is absolutely thrilling. The roller coaster's such a great invention because what it does is bring a little bit of magic into ordinary life. Our oceans, rivers, lakes, and seas can be challenging. To cross them, we throw ourselves at the mercy of the elements. I think there is a kind of romance about setting off over the horizon. We carved out simple floating vessels and harnessed the power of the winds and currents, often in the face of great danger. Those early sea journeys were horrific. The number of ships that were lost was extraordinary. What changed to make onboard conditions not just desirable, but the reason for travel? What feats of engineering had to be overcome? You have to worry about the equilibrium of this thing. What happens if you tilt it a little bit? Is that stable or is it going to topple over? This is the story behind some of the biggest ships on our seas and oceans today capable of taking us to the most remote destinations on our planet. The cruise ship, a great invention, spawned by our love of travel by sea.
Human beings are hardwired to be curious and to explore. We can jump in a plane or a fast car and go wherever we like quickly. Or we can also choose to travel by sea at a more sedate pace on a cruise ship. Cruise ships are such a great invention because they enable a sort of a pretty energy efficient way to take thousands of people around beautiful places that they would otherwise never get to go to. According to industry research, 30 million tourists globally were predicted to cruise in 2019. And the annual number is expected to keep on rising. Today, cruises visit 2,000 ports of call around the world, assuaging our appetite for the new and the different. We also like to relax and indulge ourselves, enjoy comfort, and feel spoilt. On a cruise, there is a lot of entertainment provided for the guests, usually great food as well, and they get to meet other guests too. So overall, the experience is fantastic for them. Cruise ships are a multi-billion dollar industry providing significant employment. Marine engineers are constantly innovating the ships, and designers develop increasingly sophisticated attractions to entice people on board. Yet fundamentally, a cruise ship is a large floating box with an engine and lots of small boxes on top, and it carries passengers from one destination to another. Since cruise ships began, each floating assembly of boxes is like a treasure trove of treats. In a highly competitive market, with every new ship's design, operators strive to stand out to win our business. At the root of this great invention was our desire to travel across water as fast as the winds could carry us. And more comfortably than basically sitting on floorboards. But how did we do it? For thousands of years, water transportation was simple. We had no roads to help us move around on land, so traveling across any terrain could be slow and inhospitable. The reality is that for most of human history, seas and rivers aren't barriers. They're actually the most effective way of traveling uh, long distances. We can trace boat building back to the Neolithic Stone Age. This rock art in Norway is as much as 6,000 years old. Archaeologists have found dugouts dating back 8,000 years. This one in the Maritime Museum in Oslo is a mere 2,200 years old, a simple hollowed out tree trunk. Early seafarers were hungry for adventure as well as for food. We always think the grass is greener. We must explore, it's part of our nature. If you stop human beings exploring, you stop them being human beings. Communities around the world develop their own wooden vessels, all powered by the winds and sometimes oars, many still used today in modern incarnations. Early versions of this sampan in China navigated up and down the Yangtze River, for example. Dows, similar to this one, sailed the rivers and waterways of the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. The feluccas that these are derived from were working on the River Nile for thousands of years BCE. By 1500 BCE, the Polynesians had developed relatively advanced technology, strapping together two canoes which gave their vessels greater stability. This 1949 footage shows replicas of vessels that carried Polynesians to colonize the islands of Hawaii in 500 CE. So early pioneering seafarers had figured out the rudiments of how things float. But we needed to understand this better. 
if we were to develop our capacity to carry more things and more people across water. The theory wasn't properly understood until a certain ancient Greek was enjoying a private moment. It was to prove to be one of the biggest moments in time and in the history of the cruise ship. Remember who shouted Eureka, but why? You may have heard that famous story of Archimedes getting in the bath and then literally shouting Eureka. This moment of realization that his body displaces the same amount of water as its own volume. And this led to Archimedes' principle, which is what accounts for the buoyancy of, of boats. The ancient Greek word Eureka means, I found it. Archimedes turned it into an expression that's now understood the world over. He had discovered the law of buoyancy. Something will float on water if the downwards force of gravity is less than the upwards force created by the buoyancy of the water. So in other words, a boat will float if it weighs less than the amount of water that it displaces. But how can an enormous cruise ship made of heavy component parts of iron and steel with thousands of people on board possibly float? Over time, as boats have gotten bigger and bigger and more impressive, they're still ultimately following that, that first basic principle of, of physics, of water displacement uh, creating buoyancy. And so these big ships aren't really doing anything that more special than a little canoe. Archimedes' Eureka moment was a game changer. We were beginning to understand the science of building larger, more complex craft to travel on water. These would be able to carry more people in one go. Crossing the Atlantic became one of the most important routes in international travel. For instance, we know the Vikings sailed west between the 8th and 11th centuries CE. They traveled from various parts of Scandinavia to North America, leaving lasting evidence of a settlement in Newfoundland. For most of human history, you travel because you have to. You travel because you're part of an invading army, or you travel because you're escaping something at home, or you travel because you hope to make money. Empire building was a major incentive. A cluster of famous Atlantic crossings were made by Italian explorers, led by Christopher Columbus in 1492. Columbus, who was sponsored by Spain, paved the way for future European travelers migrating to the New World. These voyages continued until the next transatlantic milestone, which saw the Pilgrim Fathers flee England to build a settlement on the east coast of North America. The Mayflower set sail in 1620 from England, bound for the New World, depicted in this romanticized film made in the 1950s. It was to be the most grueling of journeys, miserable and overcrowded. Those early sea journeys were horrific. The number of ships that were lost was extraordinary. Conditions on board were terrible. We didn't have refrigeration, for instance, so the food was shocking. You would really have to want to form a new world to get on that boat. I think the only thing that would sustain you would be the promise of something much, much better at the other end, because that kind of travel was probably hell on earth. The 102 passengers were puritanical Protestants desperate to escape their ungodly homeland. They wanted to establish a farming community in Virginia where they would build their own church. They set off relying solely on the power of wind with an estimated 37 crew and the captain on board. The sanitation on the boat probably would have been pretty poor. So they would have experienced dysentery, tummy upsets as a result of that. There may not have been fresh water on the boats or indeed fresh fruits and vegetables. So the likely consequence of that could have been dehydration, perhaps even 
um, poor nutritional intake, and it could lead to conditions such as scurvy, for example. The crossing was to last 66 days, a voyage into the unknown. For most of the passengers, it means a knowledge that you're not ever going to see your home again. But for those who will see the promised land, that's exactly what they expect to find. They are leaving behind the corruptions of Europe. They're leaving behind the intolerance of England. And they're going to build a city on the hill, the New Jerusalem. And so that has to be worth it. It's a journey of faith. Faith also that the winds would carry them however long it took and however grim the journey. Today's cruise ships are a service industry with passengers' comfort paramount. They're a masterclass in precision planning in every area. We are a floating hotel, so we have to be so self-sufficient. And in terms of planning, organization, we need to ensure we have everything we need from um, the safety perspective, from uh, food supplies, water supplies. In this classless cruising world, all passengers can expect a degree of luxury. For decades, that has meant a private self-contained cabin with its own bathroom and other conveniences. In a day like today, we turn around 1,300 cabins. We have, in average, 2,600 guests embarking today. Everything in the housekeeping department is on a massive scale to service all these rooms and more from eye-wateringly large stocks. We have like 30,000 pillowcases, just for an example. In terms of towels, we have more than 50,000 towels of different sizes and purpose um, on board the ship. When the ship is ready to depart on its next cruise, all 19 decks will be ship shape and thousands of excited passengers will be hotly anticipating their new adventure. Back in the early 18th century, enabling passenger ships to travel further and faster was the next challenge. Under sail, the journey from Europe across the Atlantic could take at least six weeks or more. We had to invent a way to stop us relying on winds and currents, which are so unpredictable and uncontrollable. When the Industrial Revolution came along, there had to be a new mechanical solution for ships. Inventive minds turned to a technology which had been around for nearly 2,000 years that had never been usefully exploited. A mathematician and engineer called Heron of Alexandria had worked with a simple combination of water and fire to create steam. His isopile, or windball, was the first steam-powered engine. Heron's design has a sealed cauldron of water placed over a fire. Fixed to the cauldron are two hollow tubes suspending a hollow sphere with two outlet tubes. The steam from the cauldron rises through the tubes into the sphere and out of the outlet tubes. This causes the sphere to rotate. At the time, it was simply an amusing toy with no practical applications. And its potential for marine technology lay dormant for centuries. Hungry for progress and efficiency in the 18th century, engineers started playing around with steam power. The turning point came in 1769, when Scotsman James Watt patented his improved steam engine. And the Industrial Revolution got going in earnest. American engineer Robert Fulton is credited with inventing the first viable steamboat, which was trialed on the Hudson River in 1807. The steam engine drove two side paddle wheels, which propelled the ship forward, although the ship was also fitted with sails. The Claremont became the world's first steamboat in public service, putting Fulton into the record books. 
Paddle steamers have continued to operate until the present day on many of the rivers of North America, including the Mississippi. In fact, cruising has proved to be an incredibly successful invention on the world's waterways, from the Danube to the Nile. Crossings between Europe and North America were to become considerably shorter thanks to steam. The first steam-powered ocean-going ship to make this journey was the SS Savannah in 1819. Like the Claremont, she was a hybrid of sail and steam, her steam funnel just visible through the sails. This was truly the start of a new era. We would never have to rely on wind power again. We had the passenger capacity, but decent accommodation for all was woefully inadequate. We had the technology, but it needed improvement for long-distance voyages. Perhaps the ancient Greeks would have the answer once again. Archimedes had invented a screw, like this modern copy in the Netherlands, which can remove water from the bottom of a ship. By turning the inclined screw, water at the bottom is forced up and out at the top. Its potential for propulsion inspired a Czech called Joseph Russell, whose invention patented in 1827 is still in use today. Russell's idea took up much less space in the ship than paddle wheels and was more efficient. It was called a screw propeller. The SS Archimedes, named in honor of the genius ancient Greek, was the first steamship to be fitted with Russell's screw propeller. These ships have a, a propeller on the underside and what they're doing, by spinning this propeller, it creates a column of water that you're forcing out the back of the ship. Just by Newton's third law, if you're pushing on the water, that means the water's pushing on you. So if you're shoving a column of water going out the back, then actually the water is pushing back and that's what's giving you thrust. It's what's propelling you forwards. Steamship design evolved quickly from here. By 1843, British engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel launched the SS Great Britain, now carefully restored to its former glory. Brunel appeared to be breaking all marine engineering records and rules. With the capacity to carry 252 passengers and 130 crew, she was bigger than any previous ship. She was made of heavy wrought iron, and her steam engine was the biggest and most powerful yet, and drove one of Joseph Russell's new screw propellers. So the bigger the ship, the more powerful the propulsion needs to be. You need really, really big propellers to provide enough force to move all that water out of the way. But the motivation to build the SS Great Britain was still not about the journey itself. She was not a cruise ship. After her Atlantic crossings, she went on to carry thousands of immigrants from Europe to Australia. It is said that half a million people now living in Australia can count their ancestors among those who traveled on the SS Great Britain. All contemporary cruise ships are driven by propellers. They don't have to move fast, but it's important that a voyage isn't bumpy so they have more than one. We have two propellers, so two propulsion motors, which drive the propeller shaft, which is then attached to the propeller. We are outward hand, which basically means one goes clockwise, one goes anti-clockwise. So our propellers like that, to minimize vibration. When any ship prepares to embark on a new cruise, like this one in the 1970s, the crew want to be sure their guests will enjoy a smooth voyage. Stand by below. Stand by below. Turning today's even larger ships in the relative confines of a harbor is a great skill, all masterminded from here, the bridge, 
where the captain and his team direct the voyage. When we are doing maneuvering over the ship, uh, it's captain or myself. The instruments that we are using is all this uh, top-notch equipment that we're having on board. A radar with the electronic chart. We have also all controls and all the indicators with the vessel movement. Uh, the most important factors during the maneuver that we're watching is the wind, the current. We have two propellers, one on each side, and then we have two rudders as well, one directly behind each of the propellers. Uh, the thrusters are the, the small propellers that are pushing water from one side to the other of the ship, and those are making the ship turn. Of course, then we can turn the ship 360 degrees in one spot. It's testament to incredible modern engineering that a cruise ship can turn in a confined space using a combination of mechanics and the forces of nature, winds, currents, and water which is so much harder to move in than air. The water is incredibly dense and it's viscous. So you actually need a lot more force and torque to be able to, to, be able to get that thrust, but you'll get more from it just because it's more dense. So actually, those propellers on, on cruise ships, they don't appear to go round very fast, but you're getting you know, a lot of propulsion out just because it's water and not air. Such a massive vessel takes a long time to stop in water. You can't put the brakes on and stop a ship like you can a car. When the captain of this ship, the Costa Concordia, changed course in Italian waters, she ran aground on a rocky outcrop. Most passengers escaped in lifeboats, but 32 were killed and the captain was jailed for manslaughter. Fortunately, accidents like this are extremely rare, but it demonstrates the risks and navigational skills required to maneuver a cruise ship. From the mid 19th century, steamships carrying passengers were operating all over the world, but they were still not called cruise ships and they were expensive. It wasn't until a German shipping magnate, Albert Ballin, spotted an opportunity that the cruise line business was born. In 1891, Ballin's masterstroke was to organize the first ever Mediterranean cruise on board the Augusta Victoria, hosted by Ballin himself with his wife. The cruise lasted 57 days with 241 passengers on board. The ship sailed from Southampton down through the Strait of Gibraltar and round the Mediterranean, stopping at more than a dozen ports along the way. It's one of the great developments of the modern age that people begin to travel just for the sake of traveling. It's the product of rich people who want to see the world. It's the invention of the tourist, if you like. Baleen's big idea was that the journey should be a pleasure, not a pain. Fastest didn't necessarily mean best. He wanted to provide unrivaled luxury for first-class passengers to enjoy the ride, with larger cabins, the finest decor, and food that matched the smartest hotels in the world. Next came Baleen's greatest triumph, the design and launch of the world's first cruise ship, built specifically for ocean cruising, the Princessin Victoria Louise. A model of the ship sits in the International Maritime Museum in Hamburg, Germany, home city of the original ship. Designed as a pleasure yacht, offering unrivaled luxury, her maiden voyage in 1901 took passengers from Hamburg to New York. The Princess and Victoria Louise carried first-class passengers exclusively in 120 spacious ensuite cabins. No lower classes were catered for, unlike the majority of other transatlantic services at the time, where the cheap ticket holders had nothing to look forward to except the destination. Traveling in third class as these 1930s passengers had to, often meant sleeping in bunks close to the engine room, where stoking the fire with coal to create steam made it noisy, hot, and dirty.
the engine room on a contemporary cruise ship is still noisy, but not nearly as grimy as those early steamboats. And these days, passengers aren't allowed anywhere near. The engine takes up the entire first and second decks, with weight distributed in a relatively spacious area to aid buoyancy. The ship is a floating diesel-electric powerhouse, requiring constant monitoring and maintenance. Power generated from its six diesel engines is enough to run, for example, 130,000 homes in a northern European climate for an hour. We are asynchronous, which basically means once we are generating and moving, we generate the power that we need. So, for example, if we require a full speed run, we would put all six engines on. If we are on a slow speed run, we can achieve that until the temptation would normally be to take your foot off the accelerator, but partial loading on big engines like this, they don't like it. They like to be at the top screaming and uh, really thumping it out. So, to achieve a moderate speed, it's more efficient to run two engines at full power than four engines at half power. It's a turnaround day, and the tanker is arriving to replenish stocks in the ship's 20 fuel tanks. Coal is long gone, replaced by more efficient and powerful oil. This will be giving us our fuel stem for today, for next cruise, 12 days. And today we are going to be lifting 1.1 million liters of fuel in two different grades. The ship runs on a combination of marine fuel oil and marine gas oil. At capacity, she can cruise for 8,000 kilometers without refueling. It's an ongoing obsession with marine engineers to design ships that travel further with less fuel. It's all about efficiency, because you might change the angle of the bow, for example, and that could make a massive difference to the amount of fuel you use or you could change the shape of a propeller blade. Just these small changes make a huge difference. I think that's what excites engineers. Since the first cruise ships, the other major fuel on board has been the stuff that keeps the thousands of passengers and crew going, as seen in this 1960s promotional film. Eating is one of the real joys of shipboard life where even the healthiest appetites meet their match. Even breakfast can give you the choice of dozens of items. The catering department must ensure that there are enough provisions ordered to suit the tastes and appetites of every guest for the duration of the next cruise. So how do you feed over 4,000 passengers and crew? Answer? The work never stops. Why we need uh, the 24-hour bakery on board is because throughout the night, we need to prepare all the bread for the breakfast. In addition to that, the room service is 24 hours. And our international cafe, they have breads, croissants and pastries, Danish pastries, etc. Meanwhile, upstairs, passengers can enjoy a slower pace of life if they so wish. Some people view water as very calming, um, very hypnotic. They enjoy that process. They enjoy the slowness of it. And I think it's good for your mental well-being to travel to other places where you're stepping outside of your comfort zone. You're learning about other cultures, other countries, other foods, and all this is good for the brain. There have been periods when cruise ships have offered rest and relaxation doing a very different role. In times of war, they rescue and provide medical treatment as hospital and transport ships to serving soldiers. This one was requisitioned as a Red Cross hospital ship in World War II. Here, bringing wounded soldiers home from service in Africa. With the Red Cross at her masthead, a former luxury liner enters a British port. She is now the hospital ship Atlantic. The fact that these cruise ships are used in war is a, is a brilliant illustration of what they actually are, which is just 
a very large vessel capable of taking huge numbers of people from one place to another, that these are actually just a means of transport. In peace, they're decorated, they're filled with entertainment, and their reality is hidden. And in war, that becomes apparent. But marketing makes sure that people know that every new cruise ship or liner is so much more than just a very large vessel. The hype around Titanic's launch was immense. She was hailed as the world's largest liner, her design and spec outstanding. She had cost $7.5 million to build, roughly $170 million in today's money. For some people, the Titanic's just, you know, just another ship. It's just the thing that's going to take them um, at speed um, from, from, from the UK to, to America. However, she wasn't just another ship, but for all the wrong reasons. Safety measures had been cut, with not nearly enough lifeboats for the number of passengers and crew on board. When Titanic famously hit an iceberg, most of those on board didn't stand a chance. It is advertised as the latest and the most impressive and the safest and the fastest and the most technologically advanced ship that's ever been built. And that's why the catastrophe is so shocking, because this is about the capacity to produce something utterly, utterly wonderful and that being destroyed by a combination of human error and the natural world. And that's why it's such a terrible, terrible shock. Titanic had been marketed as unsinkable, and yet the unthinkable happened, with over 1,500 lives lost. Experts now reckon Titanic sank because of a fatal combination of reasons. The captain didn't take iceberg warnings seriously, the crew didn't have binoculars to spot how close the icebergs were, and the ship was traveling too fast in those icy conditions. One of the, the issues was um, that they just weren't able to turn quick enough, so they hit the iceberg, right? But the other thing was that they had this system in place to, to enable this sort of scratch, but they just pushed it too far. They were sort of like air tanks. You know, a certain number could allow water in should a collision occur, and it still would be fine. That's why they called it unsinkable, because they thought, oh, this is foolproof. But it turned out that if you did too many, then it's past the point that it's stable anymore. Tragedy provided big lessons. Cruise ships and ocean liners today are built to much higher standards of engineering and quality of materials. Advanced technology ensures that accurate and reliable hazard warnings are given much sooner. Crew training is more rigorous with vastly improved communication systems. Everybody on board can feel their ship is virtually unsinkable. I think they combine a feeling of total safety and security with a, a sense of adventure. The measures in place are so strictly observed Cruising these days is one of the safest possible modes of transport. We're now in a period of growth. 50 new ocean-going cruise ships are expected to be at sea by 2027. Construction of this new cruise ship represents more mind-boggling statistics. She is taking three years to build, from cutting the first piece of steel to launch, and she will be six meters longer than the height of the Eiffel Tower when she's finished. Any form of travel always involves me thinking about how it's functioning and how it's been built and constructed. And cruise ships are really fascinating because they are made of such heavy materials. The material that a cruise ship is made out of, if you had a solid block of that metal, it would sink, for sure. But the way it's designed to incorporate air and space and surface area means that it floats. After the prefabricated hull has been put into position in the construction shed, she is built up from that level, mostly resembling building blocks that slot together. 
every detail has been planned while mindful of the bigger picture. You have to worry about the equilibrium of this thing. What happens if you tilt it a little bit? Is that stable or is it going to topple over? So you have to think about the stability and that essentially is what determines the sort of the shape of the underside of a, of, of a ship. You know, how can we make it so that it's stable that if any small displacement that may come from currents in the water or things like that, that will write it back up so it's not going to just fall over. Altogether, she requires 3 million man hours to construct. And she will have cost around $760 million from start to finish. A century ago, shipyards looked very different, with so many more jobs done by skilled workers. However, working conditions were dirty and dangerous. Building cruise ships was ultimately about creating an irresistible destination where dreams would come true. In the 1930s, cruising was still a pursuit exclusively for the rich, and that would become unsustainable. The cruise ship industry was heading for a crisis. People's attitudes and personal circumstances began to change as the world recovered from another painful war. By then, many workers had begun to have paid holidays and more disposable income. The cruise ship industry was in danger of being out of touch. However, in 1952, the SS United States was launched, the most modern ocean liner yet. Apart from offering speed and comfort, like so many liners before her, she appealed to those with a taste for luxury. But all this was not enough to stop the turning tide. A new era of international holiday travel was dawning with the jet age. Package holidays were the new way to go and appeal to the masses. The real advent of package tours, of mass foreign travel for ordinary people in England uh, and, and Europe is, is the post-war period. It's the 1950s and 1960s, in which the arrival of cheaper air travel means that ordinary people can go to the places that were not allowed before. The modern holiday industry was born. Cruise ships couldn't compete with air travel on speed. What they could offer was an alternative journey with accommodation in a luxury hotel. But now it must be for everyone, one class cruising we see the democratization of all this. Not completely, but it means that the cruise brings to a much broader range of people that experience which had been pioneered in the 19th century. The key was for cruise ships to carry more people on each journey and give them what they wanted, luxury at an affordable price. In the 60s, they first became quite popular um, because they were rebranded as, you know, fun ships. So here is an opportunity to spend time traveling to other parts of the world on water. By economies of scale and much larger ships, they could bring the per capita cost down, which would draw in a wider clientele. They used to be just for the rich. You know, it was confined to those who could afford it. And I think as time's gone on, they've become cheaper and more accessible. There are two big drivers in the cruise ship world today. One is size. The other is ever more ambitious amenities, both onboard experiences and destinations. Within the cruise industry, there's a belief that bigger is better. The companies between them are always vying for guests. How can we attract guests to come to our product? Arguably, some places can only be visited by sea, like the Galapagos area, with its incredible wildlife to be seen nowhere else on the planet. Arctic and Antarctic cruises take people up close to more awe-inspiring wildlife with the kind of access that just isn't possible any other way opening our eyes to extraordinary parts of the planet that remind us of our fragility. 
I think going to the Arctic would be interesting for two reasons. First, I think it's a huge reminder of just how important those areas are to the survival of the planet. Two friends of mine that have been just talk about this extraordinary, humbling beauty. That gives you a real sense of perspective. We've been fascinated by these frozen worlds since we discovered them. And cruises have been carrying intrepid holiday makers there since the late 19th century. Polar class cruise ships present specific challenges to engineers and designers to deal with the cold and ice. If you're traveling to the Arctic, there are additional considerations like, can the material of the ship withstand essentially the impact of icebergs, which when you're traveling at speed can be the equivalent of like slamming into a mountain face. How do you propel yourself in waters that contain a lot of solids? It's a very different challenge compared to just cruising along an ocean that doesn't contain icebergs. And when a cruise ship can no longer serve at sea, there is sometimes an afterlife. The SS Rotterdam, for example, is a museum as well as a local hotel in its home city. With sustainability the watchword of our time, cruise ships will need to undergo another revolution in design. In an industry that enjoys scale, should the size of each ship be shrinking? There have been appeals for ships to be more compatible with small historical cities where fragile ecosystems are at risk. The numbers of tourists they disgorge for brief encounters with their target destinations put strains on limited resources and a phenomenon known as over-tourism. Environmental campaigners want greater attention to be paid to cruise ships' carbon footprints and emissions. The industry's use of vast quantities of toxic heavy fuels is having a harmful impact on our oceans, seas, and air quality. The answer could be blowing in the wind. The big thing that shipping can do is it can more easily be made environmentally sustainable much more so than, um, than air travel, for instance. So that's the really big advantage, that we can, we can shift huge amounts of people and goods around in a more environmentally efficient way. Engineers and designers are looking at alternative energies, including hybrid electric engines. Tankers are already able to use a kite rig to tow them by harnessing the powerful ocean winds. They can supplement their traditional fossil fuel consumption, cutting costs and emissions using a free resource. Large tankers have got kites that sort of launch off the front and they harness the power of the wind, which reduces their emissions. So I can certainly see an ability to harness the wind becoming ever and ever more popular, because actually it's very, very cheap. It works by catching the wind in the kite, which pulls the rope from the winch. A generator converts the rotatory power from the winch into electricity. Finding a solution like this for cruise ships might be difficult. Perhaps there will be combinations of more planet-friendly fuels and sustainable energies in future. I don't think in the near future you're going to see shipping powered purely by wind and solar, because the amount of stuff you have to shift requires fuels with very high, what they call energy density, like a lot of oomph. What you might see is alternative fuels, biofuels or fuels made from carbon taken from the atmosphere. Liquid methane is another good fuel that we can now use. The economies that the engine designers are now doing for burning of fossil fuels is uh, awesome. They are always developing, always changing, making it more economical. Economical, apart from the financial gains, is also we burn less for the same power, therefore less impact on emissions and or any other producing of sludge from the heavy oil. While engineers work at new, more planet-friendly technologies, at the other end of the spectrum, onboard entertainment will continue to push the boundaries. 
This first ever cruise ship roller coaster, named the Bolt, promises riders they'll travel about 60 kilometers per hour with plenty of twists and turns along the way. For those with less thrilling ambitions for their cruise, there will be other new entertainment. It's almost like a one-stop shop. You get to see different countries, travel without having to take your suitcase out, go to a different hotel, hire a car, do all of that. It's all in this one space. You can have a social life, you can have an active life, you can just sit on deck and watch the world go by, but you're traveling all the time. So I think these are all the reasons why a lot of people love cruise ships. We've traveled a long way from the humble canoe. As vessels have grown bigger and more sophisticated, the energy we use has shifted from the natural power of the wind to coal-fired steam to today's diesel engines. Tomorrow, who knows? Maybe we'll go back to using wind and other sustainable sources of energy. Cruise ships give us an inherently simple way to travel that takes us into a mini world away from it all, far away from traffic jams and airport queues. The need to explore the world and its oceans and seas from a comfortable base will surely never leave us. What we have now is a world in which relatively ordinary people get to spend a fortnight at a time living a life that they would never have been able to live in previous centuries. And that surely is a good thing.